Sinbadi. The things haven't changed here for more than a thousand years since the days of Sinbad. And that's why I'm here, because I'm going to take one of these about a thousand miles south to Zanzibar. Welcome to the world of Simbad the Sailor and the start of an amazing adventure. My quest will take me down the northeast African coast from Lamu in Kenya to the tiny village of Kapini, then to the bustling port of Mombasa, and then to the voodoo island of Pemba, and finally to Zanzibar, the place once called the island at the end of the world. I'm about to sail into the life of an extraordinary character, a swashbuckling Arab seaman, explorer and merchant. The stories of Sinbad the Sailor astonish generations with tales of bizarre people and strange mythological creatures from unknown lands. And my adventure is launched just as it would have been in Sinbad's day, over a thousand years ago. Every man from the nearby village is here to drag 12 tons of solid teak to where she'll eventually meet the rising tide. The Indian teak hull is incredibly strong. Dows even smaller than this carried Arab sailors all the way to China and back again. Simbad's crew would have been men just like these. They don't need plans or modern tools. Their boat building skills are handed down from father to son. And it's a special privilege to be allowed to join them as they celebrate seamanship, strength and manhood. This initiation is vital if I want to be part of their world. Because these East African sailors are the living Sinbads of the 21st century. Without compass or sextant, they still ply the coastal trade routes pioneered during the first millennium. But Sinbad himself is a man lost in mythology, a combination of many men and many deeds. One theory is that he came from Baghdad. The Baghdad merchants of his day controlled the vast Indian Ocean trade route, past Ceylon, through the Indonesian Spice Islands, all the way to China. My first stop on Sinbad's trail is here in Lamu, once a fortress port protected by the Sultan of Oman. This was a medieval Cape Canaveral, a launch pad for men brave enough to step off the ends of the earth, a likely place for Sinbad to start his African adventures. In these streets and buildings built of coral, he would have bought trade goods, spices, gold, ivory, leopard skins, rhino horn, peacocks, and generations of slaves. And this waterfront was Sinbad's last site of modern civilization. From here, he sailed south to seek his fortune. And I want to find a Dow to do the same thing. But I'm a Mzungu, the Swahili word for European, so I need a formal introduction to the right captain. 
they have to charge you the price. Swali here you, is the local shipping agent. Right. But in the end, it's up to me to bargain my way on board a DAO. Not an easy task when you don't speak the language. So it's, so it's from here, um, Papini, mm -hmm. and then Malindi, mm -hmm. Mombasa. And here's a and tip. Pemba, Never try to rush business in Africa. If I'm pushy, I'll pay twice what I need for my passage or miss out altogether. 5,000 shillings. 5,000. You know, I don't take up much space, you know. Uh, it's a big price. Can you do something better for me? Come on. Come on, take one more to another company. He agree he can make you for 3-5. Three, 3-5. Five. Three, five. Yes. Okay. 3,500. That's great. Finally, the captain agrees, but he warns me to be ready to sail with the afternoon tide. He won't wait. And nothing else is sailing south for at least a week. So what I'd really like to find is a, an antique shop or something that sells really old things. The pressure is on. I've got just over four hours to find all my trade goods. I need antiques and perishable goods, such as grain and tobacco. And I have to get them at the cheapest price I can. Because like Simbad, I need to make a profit, or at least break even. But this is the best in Lamu, the antique shop which we have. So junk shop Lamu, huh? Yeah, this is old shop for junks. Usually the Lamu people, they were carving the woods and making their own junks. I've always been looking for these. These used to actually be made of rhino horn, which is obviously highly illegal these days. But how old is this yeah, one? Yeah, this is the original Jambia. Oh, really? From 1370. Ah, oh, it's beautiful. Really lovely. My plan is to trade the antiques in towns where they sell to foreign dealers, such as Mombasa. And I might even keep some for myself. So, if we take the sword, the knife, mm -hmm. and like this, this chest, mm -hmm. um, and these two, mm -hmm. and Aladdin's lamp here. Mm -hmm. 130,000 shillings. 130,000, wow, that's... No. That's too much for me. <laughs> he said it's very little. <laughs> and here's another business tip. You've got to bargain. The louder and more creatively, the better. I, I'll offer him 30,000. very expensive junk. He said he cannot go less than 56 for you, 500. 56 for 100. Yeah, 56. Okay. Okay. Very good. Okay. You're a very good Finally, we get there. We've got him down to half the opening price. For 56,000 Kenyan shillings, or around $500 US, I'm in business. Well, that's pretty well blown my budget as far as antiques and the things I wanted to take to Australia. So what I've got to do now is try and find a whole lot of things I can sell right the way down the coast, all the way to Zanzibar, to pay for my passage. And that's exactly what Simbad did almost a thousand years ago. Swali is waiting for me here at the grain store. He's got a good deal on the grain and tobacco that are hard to get in the coastal villages to the south. Yeah, I can't tell the difference. This is number one. Is it? Yes. OK, so we've got tobacco. Yes. We've got 10 bags of millet. Yes. Is there anything else that we can sell down the coast? Yes, zephyr over there. Zephyr. Fantastic. This is incredibly expensive in Australia. You know, the best of this stuff is about three times the price of gold. And this isn't quite that, but I think I can trade it really well down the coast and make a pretty good profit. The Dow crew is happy to earn an extra tip by getting my goods down to the waterfront. I'm glad I don't have to find my way through this maze of streets with all this stuff alone. And then I get my first sight of the ship I bargained so hard to join. Waiting for us is a solid seafaring dhow called Sauda 4. We start loading and I experience a flash of excitement. The scent of legend is in the air. I can feel Sinbad all around me.
this list and actually all my stuff, I've only got about 700 kilos. This boat can actually take about 35 tons. And I've actually seen them with cars in there. They're incredible. Too much talking. Too much talking, you say. Get on with the work. <laughs> Finally, my antiques make it. And I just hope this proves to be a treasure chest. Trading from a Dow just like this made Simbad and his fellow merchants very rich men. But as we hoist the sail, I get my first taste of what my journey will be all about. There are no mechanized winches here. The only way to take on gravity is with sweat and muscle. Finally, Saúl de Four is underway. And what an amazing feeling it is. The great changes in the course of civilization all started like this. It was like this for the great explorers, such as Cook, Columbus, Vasco da Gama, and Sinbad. As we clear the harbour, I experience the intoxicating prospect of the unknown. Somewhere far over the horizon is Zanzibar, the island at the end of the world. Two hours down the East African coast, and the Saouda is cruising on a smooth monsoon breeze. Zanzibar is many days sail to the south, and I couldn't be happier. But I'm aware I'm being sized up by my captain. They call him Ali Boss and he wants to make sure I'm not a liability at sea. It's cost me over 3,000 Kenyan shillings to be here, but on a trading dhow, even paying passengers are members of the crew. There's an unwritten rule here on the Saouda that everybody mucks in and actually pulls the ropes, puts up the sails. Even if you're not an expert like me, it's the effort that counts. And Ali Boss expects nothing less. He's been sailing and trading for 30 years. And like the Simbad of legend, he started from scratch. It said Simbad went to sea after losing his father's fortune. Well, Ali Boss has never had a fortune to lose. He relies on nothing but sail power. And with one wife in Lamu and another in Zanzibar, he's judged to be the most successful Dow trader on the East African coast. Our first destination is the tiny village of Kapini, about 50 kilometers south of Lamu, about a six hour sail. Well, this is home for the next three weeks. She's about 50 feet long or 17 meters. And she weighs about 25 tons. And in a good stiff breeze, she'll go about eight knots. That's a ripping 13 miles an hour. And technically, she's about as old fashioned as you get. There's no engine, no radar, no GPS, and no winches to haul this massive boom up. And everything depends on her lateen sail. This simple piece of design is how the Arab sailors dominated the oceans from the Mediterranean all the way to China. There's an old Swahili saying, you can't move the wind, so move the sail. By moving the huge spread of canvas from one side of the mast to the other, the crew can catch the changing wind. It's much more adaptable than a square sail. The wind can come from anywhere, and the Saouda can go wherever she likes. And 
and I figured that a picture of this giant wind machine from atop the mast would be a classic. <laughs> Ali Boss has other ideas. Clearly he thinks his paying passenger could be a problem after all. No sensible person would go to so much trouble for a photograph. <laughs> it is my profession and I did ask permission, but I guess he thought I was kidding. Well, I'm a bit, yes, <laughs> a bit crazy. <laughs> but I've seen you get up there. <laughs> One more time. <laughs> Look, I'm not kidding. As I get my dressing down, we inch into the first trading port, Capini. Fifty years ago, these people would have been part of the slave trade. They may have been victims or traders. The coastal villagers helped sell slaves from the inland to the Arab and European merchants. And so in those days, the sight of our sail on the horizon would have caused terrible fear. Today, we're very welcome because we've got what they want, sacks of grain. Everyone from the village is on the beach in the hope of making a good trade. They have plenty of cooking bananas, coconuts and mangoes. But along the coast, with its salty soil, it's almost impossible to grow millet, wheat or maize. And that's what I've got on board. And so with Ali Boss keeping a sharp eye on proceedings, it's time for me to take on the locals. Can you pass me some tamarind? You know, is this, is this fresh? Is this good? Yeah, Yeah? Okay, we'll take some tamarind and a mango. Okay. That's it. This coast is famous for these mangoes. These are a little green, but they'll be pretty good in a couple of days. Okay, we'll have the mangoes, bananas, and the tamarind. The villagers will give me what I need, but they want three sacks of millet plus cash. That's pretty expensive. In the end, I give them a sack of grain in exchange for a sack of mangoes, two bunches of cooking bananas, and a sack of tamarind. I have the strange sensation of being on board a time machine. Nothing has changed in over a thousand years. The villagers head quickly for shore, maybe too quickly. I'm not sure if um, I've been ripped off or not, but uh, I think we've done pretty well. For a bag of maize, we've gained a whole lot of fresh food. That's not going to be tradable for me, but it's going to be very good for the crew. And we'll need the energy. We're a big crew for good reason. Any fewer, and we'd never get the half ton of sail up the mast. Mombasa is around 200 kilometers south. With a good wind, it should be an easy sail. But with no engine, no compass, and uncertain weather, we are literally sailing into the unknown. A 
A week and a half into our journey to Zanzibar, and I've got my sea legs well tuned. There are a dozen of us living and working on this tiny sloping deck. And out here, you've got to stay on your toes, literally. These shark-infested waters leave no room for a clumsy stumble, followed by an unplanned swim. We're two kilometres, or just over a mile, off the East African coast, between the tiny village of Kapini and Mombasa. And as we go through the constant routine of tacking and hauling canvas, I'm slowly starting to get to know my crewmates. They're hard men, tough and resilient. This alley boss look-alike is called Captain Makora, or Cheeky Monkey. He's 60, and as helmsman, he navigates using nothing but the skyline and the sun. He went to sea at five as a cabin boy. Muni is 32. He's a Kaikuyu tribesman from Mombasa. He's been at sea for 10 years and has just saved enough money to get married. The oldest man on board is Ibrahim Salim. He's 80 and has spent most of his life as a fisherman. Now he's assistant navigator and elder statesman. He no longer likes to go ashore, but he's got two wives and five children aged between 20 and 50. And here's an important man. Ali Ahmed is the cook. He's 30 and has worked all over the world. And he and I are about to make ourselves very popular. largest tuna in the Indian Ocean, but it will help extend the sardines and maize Ali is working on below. And this is the most terrifying galley I've ever seen. Saouda has no electric power, so heat comes from only one source, an open flame. It seems insane on an all wooden dhow that has no fire extinguishers. But Ali is completely relaxed. Down here amid the smoke and stinking bilge gas, he works miracles. Every five hours in all weather, he whips up food for 12 hungry men. It's pretty simple, spicy fish on a bed of maize. In your supermarket, these would come in cans. But out here, off the African coast, they're absolutely fresh and delicious. Wow. And they go very well with the maize meal boiled with water. This is the staple along the coast. It's a little like mashed potato, very filling. You like this? Yeah. And what is their name? Not this. It's Simsim. Simsim? Yeah. Uh -huh. We call them um, sardines. Mm. Or white bait, maybe. White. White bait. Good, yeah? No, very good. As the sun gets lower in the sky, Ali Boss is looking for a safe anchorage. The reefs off Mombasa are far too treacherous to approach at night. So we pull into one of the safe mangrove harbours that line the coast to wait for tomorrow's high tide. And as often happens in Africa, I did not expect the totally unexpected. <laughs> These are the Maasai, but they're not a coastal people. Their territory is far inland along the Rift Valley. So it's strange to see them so far from home. It turns out they're young warriors, working as security guards on the coast. Mm. 
Meanwhile, on board the Sauda, the crew makes their nightly devotion to God and the Prophet Muhammad. The two events are like a short course in the history of the East African coast. Ashore, you have ancient Africa. The culture plundered for centuries, eight million slaves, tons of ivory, spice and gold. On board the Dow, Muslim traders and a European traveler. It was the Arab and European merchants who moved the money and the slaves to the Middle East and beyond. The following day, we cruise out to catch the northern monsoon. <laughs> Ali Boss checks with the passing local to make sure we don't plough into an unexpected reef. There are no charts on board, and it's the first time the Cora has sailed this bay. But soon, we're safely back at sea. Next stop, Mombasa. But as we plough south, I have no idea that East Africa's most cosmopolitan port would signal the start of a strange new adventure. In just over 24 hours, I will leave the 21st century far behind and step into the fascinating world of East African voodoo. Mombasa at last. After two weeks at sea, we sail in under the looming 16th century guns of Fort Jesus. Through this rifle port, the Saoda looks as if she's sailing on a map of Africa. And in a way, it sums up the clash between Islam and Europe that dominated this harbour. From the middle of the 16th century, the Portuguese and Muslim potentates fought bitterly for control of Mombasa. 25,000 Portuguese and their allies died here in one siege alone. Today, Mombasa is a central trading terminus for Dow captains trading south to Zanzibar and north to Somalia and beyond. <laughs> Ali Boss advises me to unload my antiques and try for a sale. He says this is the best chance I'll have. The traders here have more cash than in Zanzibar. Meanwhile, he loads goods to sell on the voodoo island of Pemba. He'll get a good price for washing powder and foam mattresses. The mattresses are in short supply, especially in Zanzibar. As we thread our way through the main market, I think of Simbad the trader. He would have spent his life just like this, a stranger in a strange land, living off his wits the best way he could. See, I don't know if when I bought them in Lamu, if, they, if they're good pieces or not, or whether I... Uh, and I'll need to be on my toes that, to outwit this man. Jimmy Doty uh, is the most famous uh, trader in Mombasa. Quite reasonable. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Many of the African artifacts yeah. you see in your local curio shop probably pass through his hands. 50,000. So I paid 56 and a half. But anyway, how you want cash or you want to butter? Change. A butter, actually, would be good, because these okay. masks are really beautiful. Yeah, Many okay. Then them. we'll do like this. I'll give you one price, 70,000, and we'll change with the mask. Okay. Next afternoon, we're heading south. Sailing under the guns again, 
you can see how easy it would have been for the traders of Sinbad's day to renege on a deal. As he was leaving, they could have just blown him out of the water. But I think the legendary sailor would have been proud of me. These masks are worth a lot of money in the West. But I'm also well aware that they shouldn't be taken lightly. They're not just decorative. As the sun glints through the shaman's eye, I'm struck by their real purpose, voodoo. Two days later, we're coming ashore on the island of Pemba. Magic is still practiced here, and Ali Boss has agreed to be my guide. For centuries in Africa, voodoo has mixed uneasily with Christianity and Islam, and little in the mixture has changed. Pemba is about 40 kilometers or 25 miles north of Zanzibar, off the coast of Tanzania. It's a Muslim island known for its clove plantations. It's rarely visited by outsiders, and almost never by Mazungas or Europeans. And as I take portraits of these children, it's hard to connect their innocence with a common perception of voodoo. <laughs> Particularly when their carefully covered heads point to the strong influence of the Muslim religion. But this unique East African version of ancestor worship is taken more seriously than Western medicine. These two women are ill, and the priest is here to provide a cure. First, he casts a spell to call up their dead relatives. Then he sprays the village with magic water to clear the way for the arriving dead. From then on, it's up to the priest's assistants to feel the approach of the invisible spirits. They will identify the women's illness and suggest the remedy. Soon the women are possessed. Their ancestors are present. The priest works hard to make the spirits present their diagnosis. What's making the women ill? How should they be cured? Eventually, he gets his answer. Back inside their hut, he writes the cure in his own blood. Then he mixes it with plain water and gives the medicine to his patients. And I can feel myself willing the women to get better. Alibos tells me there's only a handful of motorized vehicles on Pemba. And later in the day, he manages to get hold of one to get us to the other side of the island. 
he's planning a big surprise. Somewhere up the road is something I'd never expect to see in Africa, a bullfight. For hundreds of years, the Portuguese dominated trade along the coast, and they left behind fragments of their culture, including this. While the men work up a little tribal courage, and the kids find a safe vantage point in the trees, the officials appear with a bull, which clearly doesn't want to be here. And I have to say, the East African version of the bullfight is not entirely deftifying. He has a go at the rattan carpet and runs away. Then another go. Another go. And off again. The only thing this animal wants to charge is into the wild blue yonder. I don't know if you call this bull fighting or bull baiting. I was expecting to come to an arena and uh, a little more equal odds with a bull not on a rope. But this is their tradition and they've been doing it since the Portuguese came here. And so uh, we'll leave it at that, I guess. But at least you know the bull won't be hurt. It's far too valuable to the village for that. The day on Pemba was a draining experience, and I was happy to get back to work at the port. It's a relief to meet up with the rest of the crew and our freshly patched sail. Ali Boss has agreed to help me sell my 10 remaining sacks of militant maize. And he has to be tough about it, though. A shipment has just come in from another dhow. There's a glut, and so the price will be low. But I think he's got the measure of the local shipping agent. At last I get an offer. 40,000 Tanzanian shillings, or $10 a sack. It's not as much as I want, but I'm still out in front. Now all I have to do is unload the rest of my goods in the mystical port at the end of the world. Dawn on the voodoo island of Pemba. After 48 hours on the island of magic, the crew of Saoda 4 are anxious to make the final push to Zanzibar. With a good breeze, we'll make landfall after a two-day sail. And as I enjoy the warmth of a new day, I think about the tales of Simbad. I have no doubt that he too experienced voodoo. And still today, there are so many things about Africa we don't understand. <laughs> Damn. 
the box. Then the fates intervene. The wind falls, then dies completely. We're inside of dangerous reefs and we're completely becalmed. We're at the mercy of the tide. When it turns in a couple of hours, we'll be pushed helplessly back to land. The sun blazes higher. There's a zephyr breeze and we barely move. On board, the heat is oppressive. It melts all desire to make an effort, even to talk. Dow crews have died like this. Becalmed for weeks, they have perished of hunger and thirst. Ali Boss watches the glittering ocean for a sign of wind. The hours dissolve into each other. I write to take my mind off things. Remember, we have no radio, no engine. We could be out here for days. Then suddenly we're startled into action. The boys have seen the ocean rippled by wind and the canvas fills with power. Now this is more like it. The boys shake off the heat and rejuvenated by the cool breeze, we break into a Swahili sea shanty. The next day, a really special moment for me. After all these weeks at sea, Ali Boss hands me the tiller, and I feel truly honoured. This probably looks pretty easy, but it's actually a really fine balancing act because we've got this huge sail up here, which uh, is wobbling all over the place. And this boat weighs about 25 tonnes of solid teak. And then you've got this huge rudder here. And trying to get them all together so this thing cuts straight through the water is really, really difficult. And as you see, Ali's actually adjusting this all the time because I'm steering so badly. But it's an incredible balance to try and make it not wallow in the water, which is actually what I'm making it do. Zanzibar is just 20 hours away, but it's also a place that goes thousands of years back into time. At last, Zanzibar, a port once known as the terminus at the end of the world. From the time of the Egyptian empire, Traders from Arabia, India, Indonesia, China and Europe came here to pick up their cargoes. Spices, gold, ivory and the millions of slaves. It 
was Zanzibar that helped inspire the Sinbad stories. And judging by this thick jumble of dows, it's clear that the Sinbad ethos is alive and well at the dawn of the 21st century. But first and foremost, it's the busiest dow port on the East African coast. The Sinbad stories are one thing, earning a living in a tough world is another. About half a million people live and work here. Their survival depends entirely on the spices and the imported goods coming ashore. Now I have one last task to complete my apprenticeship as a merchant. Ali Boss tells me that we will get a good price for our 60 kilos of raw tobacco. But I'm feeling pretty good. Ali Boss and the boys have taught me a lot about a disappearing world. And I feel much closer to the legend of Simbad. I can imagine him doing exactly this. Around a thousand years ago, he would have come ashore right here in just the same way. I don't think I've quite qualified as a, a great East African trader. I've just about broken even with this tobacco sale in Zanzibar. But in the end, I'd have to say this experience has been absolutely priceless. In other words, it was worth more than money can buy. At 300,000 Tanzanian shillings, I almost doubled what I paid for the tobacco. And in the end, all my trading on the journey has left me with a small profit. It's my last night ashore with the boys, and I'm anxious to repay their generosity and friendship. But there is a slight problem when it comes to celebrations. Remember, they're Muslim, so there won't be any seafaring stuff with taverns and rum. Instead, they insist I follow them through the old port to their favorite haunt, this place, Zanzibar's open-air food market. Not exactly what I had in mind, but they say it's magic, and it is. And this stuff is so delicious. It's caught every day, and they just put it out here in all these different stalls. It's just the most fantastic seafood. Then we say our goodbyes. Next stop for Saouda 4 is the coast of war-torn Somalia. I don't know when we'll sail together again, but they've taken me on a fantastic voyage. Money, huh? Thank you, my friend. Ciao. Thanks to their professionalism, I understand the legend of Sinbad. Like Davy Crockett or Robin Hood or Daniel Byrne, Sinbad is part of myth and part of reality, an amalgam of many men and many deeds. But I know that Sinbad the Sailor is alive and well today. There are hundreds of Sinbads up and down this coast, and Ali Boss is just one of them. I know that somewhere we'll meet again, because the spirit of Sinbad will always take us on a journey to the ends of the earth. Yeah.